Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're continuing in our study of the book of Acts. I think this is um, part six. Uh, if you didn't watch the, the previous five videos on this, uh, I hope you go back and watch it from the beginning. All the videos are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. We're going to pick up where we left off last time uh, in the uh, in chapter five. Uh, so before we get started, uh, Brother Joe, say hi to everybody. Yeah, this is uh, Joe with the Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, four minutes late today. Sorry about that, everybody, whoever happens to tune in. And uh, I think uh, we're at chapter five, verse six, or something like that. And uh, anyway, my channel is for fellowship and learning, so anyone that wants to sub up, uh, it's the Sebastian Dresden channel. Thank you, Luke. Back to you. All right. Okay, Brother Joe. Uh, I, you might want to adjust your camera because it's like, it's uh, not really, your face is not very centered in the, in the picture right now. So, um, all right. We're going to pick up uh, in Chapter 5. Um, what happened last time was... Um, Ananias and Sapphira, um, uh, they, they sold some property and were going to give part of the money to the, the church. And uh, Ananias lied. Uh, Peter said he lied to the Holy Ghost. He lied to God. So God killed him because he lied about it. He didn't have to sell his property. He didn't, and after he sold his property, he didn't have to give all the money to the church. He didn't have to give any of it. Uh, but the the problem was, he he uh, claimed that he sold it for a certain amount and gave the full amount to the church. And because he lied about it, uh, God struck him dead. And now we're at the point where his wife comes on the scene. She's unaware of what's happened, and we'll start right there. Um, uh, verse 7 uh, and it was about the space of three hours after when his wife not knowing what was done came in and Peter answered unto her tell me whether ye sold a land for so much and she said yea for so much then Peter said unto her how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So we did talk... Uh, quite a bit about uh, you know, speculating on this death uh, last time. So you, you might watch the end of the last video. I don't know how much we want to repeat the, our, our opinions about, you know, why God smote him dead and, and all the different thoughts on that. But brother, uh, what, do you, what do you say about this? Well, I was, uh, I was thinking about it after we finished our uh, talk yesterday and I guess the one word that comes to my mind after considering what could have, you know, what was the, the, the purpose behind this is hypocrisy. Uh, uh, something that is rampant in the church today. Uh, I think that was the sin uh, that, that, uh, that just God would not tolerate in the, in the first century church. Uh, you know, they were not compelled to give anything. And uh, you know, uh, with great blessing, I guess, comes great responsibility, right? To whom much is given, much is uh, expected. And so, uh, you know, how many people today in church uh, uh, are hypocrites? <laughs> I would probably say that maybe uh, the majority, I don't know. Uh, we always want to look a little bit holier than we are, right? Uh, and we, we uh, trick ourselves into saying, well, you know, I don't want to appear unholy because my ministry uh, could be hurt. Uh, other people could be damaged if they, they knew my sins or, or my shortcomings. 
uh, when in fact it's it's just goes right back to the original sin of pride I think and uh, you know I don't think we need to advertise our sins uh, but we we don't at the same time need to try to look holy and and if you're gonna and, and certainly not holier than you are and I think that's what was going on here and uh, so I think that was the reason and that was the the ultimate sin back to you Luke Well, um, I think hypocrisy, I mean, there are people that we know on YouTube uh, that, um, and not just on YouTube, but um, just in the church in America, that they, um, they want to single out uh, certain particular types of sins and um, say, these sins are so great that they're intolerable. Some even say that if you do this particular sin, you, you're you reprobate, you can't even get saved. Um, but um, all of mankind's sins have been paid for. So it, it really is a moot point. Their sin is not the issue uh, between man and God anymore. That was resolved through Jesus's death on the cross. But if we're going to compare sins for a moment uh, to me the sin that seemed to bother jesus the most was uh religious hypocrisy um he was quite forgiving and tolerant and loving of the the prostitute uh the same thing with the 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 tax collector with uh matthew and also the little guy in the tree i think he was also ananias but uh uh, the, the tax collectors, I mean, they, they were Jewish people that were collecting taxes from other Jewish people for on behalf of Rome. They were probably the most despised uh, among all the, the Jewish people. Um, so the, the, the religious people, they hated the tax collectors. They hated the prostitute. But what Je Jesus was very loving and forgiving to them, it was the religious hypocrites that Jesus really let him have it. I mean, he, he, he called him a lot of names, um, hypocrites, snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs. And so, I, and I have to agree with, with, with Jesus, this hypocrisy to just to me. I mean, if I was going to judge sins, it's one of the, it's the type of sin that really, really bothers me in people. But I, I've made other videos about this and, I had to confess that I, I think that I have some hypocrisy in me. And, and we, we, I think that you could probably look at just about any type of sin and you can find there are degrees of it in all of us. It's just a question how, how big of a hypocrite we are. You know, some people are just really, really, it's really obvious. And other people, maybe it's, it's not such an issue, but there's probably a little hypocrisy in each of us. But, um, yeah, I do think that your point about hypocrisy, of course, the, fir the first problem in, in the fall of uh, Satan and then in the fall of man, we know that we could really, if we were to really um, zero in on what the real problem was, it was pride. Um, and then pride, I think, is probably related to hypocrisy, religious hypocrisy. All right, uh, before I go on, any more you want to say about all that? Yeah, no, I absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think hypocrisy and religious pride are, are uh, one and the same thing, or at least so closely related, it's hard to, in, to distinguish between the two. And so, I mean, the seven things doth God hate first, the very first thing listed is a proud look. And so uh, uh, when he was, you, you were right, you're absolutely correct. On, on Jesus got along quite well with prostitutes and tax collectors. And I think that would uh, sum up, uh, he got along with all sinners, except the proud or the religious hypocrites, uh, which he had no patience for. And so uh, I think uh, Ananias and Sapphira fell into that category. And I think uh, uh, God was doing great things to establish the church. And I think his response was mighty uh, to keep this particular thing out of the church because uh, the verse coming up, I think, says the entire church uh, was filled with fear. And so uh, uh, they got the word. Back to you, Luke. 
uh, uh, yeah, I one last thing on this hypocrisy. Uh, uh, I I made a video. How many times have I said that now, brother? But I made a video titled "The Top Five Reasons People Reject Christianity," and uh, I, I cited hypocrisy in the church as as one of the, the top five reasons. Outsiders, those people who have not yet put their faith in Jesus, and maybe they're even considering it, but when they look at you know Christians and they see the hypocrisy, it just disgusts them. And, uh, so I've always tried to make the point that look, we're we're human beings. We all have some hypocrisy in us, and it is disgusting. But Jesus is not a hypocrite. Your faith is in, is in Jesus. Don't let Christians who are hypocrites deter you or, or uh, be be the obstacle that prevents you from coming to Jesus. All right. Now let me see. Continuing on. Um, verse 11 and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch and, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them but the people magnified them. Well, I uh, I guess I'll go first today so you're not under the pressure. We, as we said last time, whoever goes first, the, the pressure's on you. But uh, this, and great fear came upon all the church. Uh, I guess maybe they, that would scare everybody that uh, you know people can just drop dead. Uh, and it's clear that God took their life. Um, uh, and uh, so it may maybe make people reconsider about, uh, you know, at least in this particular attitude that or are you going to lie to the apostles about such a thing? And in, in effect, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. Um, but they, they wrote they had many signs and wonders. And, and I, I said this so many times, and this is so important for us in, in uh, 2016 to, to understand this. So, um, signs and wonders were performed by Jesus. There's a long list of miracles he did uh, as signs. To, the miracles were very, very uh, wonderful acts of love where he would heal someone or feed people, and, and it was miraculous. Um, but the, the, the primary reason of the miracles were signs to the people to get their attention to say, well, this is miraculous. I, I need to know more about this person that, that's doing this. And so the signs were to um, get attention to Jesus and then also to convince people that he is the promised one that was promised first to Abraham and then all, all through, through all the prophets. As we discussed in the last study, all the prophets from, from Abraham all the way down, uh, you know, talked about this promised savior that would come. So these signs were to give proof that he's the one. And then it didn't stop with Jesus. We're seeing examples now of the apostles doing these signs and wonders. And the purpose again is to uh, get people's attention and be a, a what uh, Luke calls infallible proof that uh, the, the claims of Jesus were true. He is God and savior. He is the, the, the promised Messiah, the Christ. And so, um, but, and, and, the, and those things were tremendous in, in jump-starting the church. You can see that there's 3,000 converted at one sermon, and I think 5,000 converted the next time Peter preached. So you have thousands and thousands of people like joining the church and believing on Jesus and being saved uh, like in, in, immediately. Um, and without the signs and wonders, uh, I doubt very much that you would have had that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, growth of the church, if, if at all. Um, but the purpose was for a period of time to get the church started. And the scriptures tells us that these things will cease at a point, certain point. Now, it's not that 
miracles do not still happen today. I've observed miracles. Uh, I made a, my own video titled Signs and Wonders. <laughs> it's wonder, wondrous things that uh, uh, can be explained no other way except it's miraculous that, that I've uh, in, in my life. Uh, so they still happen today, but the way that they were done at this particular time in the church history was for the purpose of, of getting people's attention and convincing them to believe in Jesus. Uh, so that kind of a thing is not uh, going on uh, as it did in the, in the first century. Um, brother, your thoughts? Well, it's, it's not going on in uh, most churches. I, I think you'll find that uh, there are, uh, there are whole vast megachurches full of uh, people seeking signs and wonders today. Uh, Benny Hen comes to mind. Uh, have you seen them? People drop like flies. Uh, lots of back ailments uh, and uh, lots of headaches gone. Uh, so there, there are people that are seeking to emulate uh, the first century church, and they're using the first century churches as their proof text that what they're doing is, is quite godly. Uh, but uh, I, I, I jest just a little bit because obviously we know uh, these people are, are who you were referring to and, and one of the uh, reasons people reject Christianity, the, the, the righteousness, pride, and, and that sort of thing, because that's what it is. Uh, back then, it was a special time. You know, Christ and the apostles uh, had a special uh, dispensation from God to... Uh, uh, establish the church and fulfill the prophecies that were given in the Old Testament. Um, and I think, you know, God looks on the state of the heart uh, a lot more than he does physicality. And, and that's a good thing. Uh, otherwise, everyone would be seeking signs and wonders. And as I said yesterday, and I'm sure you would agree, the greatest miracle of all is a changed heart and a changed mind towards God. And that, uh, that sign and wonder he still does with abundance to anybody who will ask. Back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. All right, I'll read further. Um, I, now, this is verse 13. Let me read that in the Amplified because I didn't understand it in the KJV. And it says, and of the rest, durst, no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. Let me see how it's stated in the Amplified. Um, but none of the rest of the people, the non-believers, dared to associate with them. However, the people were holding them in high esteem and were speaking highly of them. Uh, all right, I'll go on to verse 14 in the KJV. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Well, I, I think I'm going to ask you to comment first on, on uh, those verses there. Well, it's, it's incredible. Uh, <clears throat> number one, the, uh, the durst, you know, I, I, I kind of had a memory that uh, meant dared, dared to. Uh, it's a good thing we have Amplified because I don't think many people have spent a lot of time studying uh, 1600s English. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the people who held uh, Ananias and Sapphira in high esteem, I guess, dared not emulate their uh, mistake. Uh, and then Peter seems to be the one um, I don't hear this of uh, any of the others who is moving in, in great signs and wonders. I'm sure that John and others uh, also, all the apostles probably did. But uh, the people seem to be focusing in on Peter, and he is the, the most vocal uh, among them. And he was so filled with the Spirit, or so uh, blessed by the Spirit, that uh, his shadow would heal people as, they passed, as he passed by. You know, that's kind of incredible. Um, that's just mind boggling. But I do have, I have an experience uh, recently, I mean, about 20 some years ago, I knew a guy who uh, was absolutely uh, 
the most holy guy I think I've ever known. Uh, he, he was just, he would, uh, uh, he was humble, but he would spend just a lot of time in prayer. And he, he seemed to be able to talk to people in a way that the spirit moved. And I remember uh, after church one day, we were sitting in at Denny's and we were sitting at a booth and the people behind us, his back was to them. And there were a couple of girls who were just swearing up a storm. And I could see my friend was greatly grieved by this. He wasn't saying a word, but he was just grieved by these two girls that were uh, so filthy in their communication behind us. And they started slowing down. And it was so funny. One of them got up and, and uh, was going to the bathroom. And when she came back, I don't know if she saw his face or what, but she apologized to him for their for their uh, talk, she, she looked at me, she said, I'm so sorry. And you could just tell that she was feeling uh, conviction for uh, just talking filthy with him sitting there. I mean, he didn't say a word. And I, I just, my gut tells me that it was a spiritual thing. They actually were convicted uh, with just because of this guy's presence. So I think the spirit does move today maybe not to that degree of Peter, but uh, in some degree, because I saw many things like I've just said. Uh, and I don't know if that's off the beaten path or not, but it's just what came to my mind. Back to you, Luke. Mm. Well, uh, in the last study, we did um, uh, single out Peter uh, regarding the, the, his preaching. Um, so far, uh, Peter is the, the only one uh, cited as the, 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 the preacher. All the sermons up to this point are given by Peter. Now, maybe there's other sermons that were just not written about, and the, the other apostles did, but at least the ones that are recorded in the scriptures, it's the preaching is all done by Peter. And uh, it's easy to think that Peter is the only one doing the miracles because of what it says about Peter's shadow. But the, the verse, you know, just before that, it, I looked back at it to be sure, and it said, um, verse 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, uh, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So um, it seems that uh, the apostles were all, or probably all, were, were um performing these signs and wonders. Um, Peter, of course, was doing them, and, and uh, uh, but for some reason, Peter is mentioned here. Maybe he is the most um, famous for it, or but they, they, they had so much faith in Peter's uh, ability to do these miracles that they were just hoping that his shadow would fall on them and they, they would be healed. Um, I, I, I'm sure that there are, are miraculous healings uh, still happening uh, in the world today. Uh, I, if I didn't believe that was the case, I wouldn't spend time every single day praying for, for miracles, for healings of, you know, friends and family. And you know, I, I, so I, I have faith and I pray for these things. And as I said, I have witnessed some that are recorded in my video, Signs and Wonders. But uh, there's a difference between God answering our prayers today and, and sometimes a miracle is his answer. And uh, the, the difference between that and in this particular time among these apostles, that individuals are have this ability as a constant, it's just the norm. They're all, they're doing it all the time, and even the scriptures talk about various gifts that people would would receive, uh, and then it talks about how these gifts would be phased out uh, eventually. Uh, but so I I don't believe that someone like Benny Hinn or many of the others that we could cite that that. Um, claim or that they're that they have this gift of healing and and that uh, I, I don't think an individual is assigned that gift today I think that 
universally any person can pray direct, directly to God and God will answer their prayer. Every prayer is answered. Sometimes we get a yes, sometimes you get a no, and sometimes the answer is we wait. Uh, we may be discouraged, but down the road the, we get the yes. Uh, so the di distinction today is, is that uh, I don't think that we can look at any individual in the world as having the gift of healing. But I do think that healings happen today. So I don't know if you see that the same way, brother, but what are your thoughts? No, I, I, think, I think I'm in 100% agreement with you, and I think that I wish the church in general would uh, see things that way too. Uh, so many people deny that uh, there are spiritual gifts today, and so many uh, proclaim that uh, certain personalities or certain persons uh, operate in the gift of, you know. And uh, I, I think you'll note that the apostles were not just given the gift of healing, but, you know, uh, they were working in the office of apostle where snake bites wouldn't have hurt them and, and such, you know. And uh, uh, I don't think a lot of the, the people that call themselves apostles today, and there's a whole bunch of them, uh, are stupid enough to let themselves be struck by poisonous snakes and not fear the outcome. Uh, but, you know, the, the gifts of the Spirit uh, are not through the priesthood and not through the apostles, but they're through everyday uh, people. The great unwashed are the ones God works through now. And uh, I do think he uses us uh, as, as vehicles. Uh, he, he wants, he desires to operate through us uh, in, in that we are in communion with him. And uh, you'll note that he uses angels as messengers. He uses people as messengers and uh, messengers of all sorts. But uh, the office of apostle with the special gifts of healing and stuff, uh, I always run and hide from people who claim to hold that staff. All right. Thank you. Well, I'll read a little further now. Um, verse 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in <laughs> the common prison. Oh, man. We talked about this last time. Is it, what is wrong with these people? I mean, we could, we could speculate on what the, the, the condition is that, uh, that, that causes them to, to witness these things, be convinced that it's a legitimate miracle, as they did in the, uh, earlier with the lame man being healed, and they put Peter and John kind of on trial, and they said, we can't argue with it. It's a legitimate miracle. No one can deny it. And yet, instead of considering it a sign, a proof that they are, uh, that it's all legitimate, and that to this, their claims about Jesus uh, and his uh, resurrection, it's all true. That's That would seem to be the, the reaction that you'd expect, uh, especially as you see every one of the people that came is being healed without exception. It says every one. And these priests, if they see that, what in the world prevents them from being saved and become joining, joining the church? But instead, they just get angry, they have indignation, and they want to put them in prison for, for healing people. It just it, it it really is. I have no uh, I have no confidence in a good answer for, for what what it, what's going on there. But what do you think? Well, you know, I'm I'm with you, Luke. I, I, I it's just perplexing. Uh, as you were speaking there, what what I thought of is is my brother has a has a business, and uh, he has a, a new hire uh, that he put in a management role, a young lady about 29 years old. And uh, he put her in charge of certain things within his company, and she's brilliant. She does a good job, and she's honest and trustworthy and everything else. Well, the person that used to have her position, who was promoted, 
uh, looks at her doing that job and I think is quite upset by the by the uh, uh, attention she's getting and by the uh, possibility that uh, the company could have a, a rising star that will outshine hers and uh, she tries at every opportunity to diminish uh, the, the shine from from uh, the performance of this younger gal and so uh, you know that's a, an example in everyday life that maybe many of us have seen but uh, as, as to this particular situation uh, you know for for the apostles to be right again that means that the leadership of Israel crucified the, the Messiah and uh, no good can come of that for them unless they uh, jump ship and, and uh, join the church and I think you'll notice that uh, everyone who did that uh, becomes uh, amongst the crowd below the apostles and nothing special anymore <laughs> you know so uh, that's all I can think Luke yeah well the uh scriptures say that uh, uh people are joining the church that that is they're putting their faith in jesus daily more people every day and and sometimes thousands at the time for that to happen uh the the, the signs are the are the, the impetus for it and peter's preaching and convicting them that they were wrong about jesus uh so this this has such a powerful result, and yet there's a select group of people, the, the religious hypocrites, the, the self-righteous religious leaders, and this is probably why Jesus kept on pointing the finger at them and saying, you are hypocrites. <laughs> That's why I think we're right in saying this religious hypocrisy is just, it's just the worst. But these people, unlike the thousands that just accept the good news and are joyful about it, they're angry and just want to imprison the apostles. Okay, I'll read further. Uh, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Um, now, I've done studies on the, uh, the term angel of the Lord, and uh, there's, it, can, it can have different meanings. I, I, sometimes it's an angel that God sends, but sometimes the angel of the Lord is actually a reference to God himself, which would be what we call a Christophany or a Theophany, um, where God comes and appears to, to men. Yeah, but uh, so sometimes the angel of the Lord is a term that means that God has come to, in, to them. But sometimes it's 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 an angelic being. Let me see how it states it in the um, uh, verse 19 in the Amplified. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and leading them out. He said, go stand and continue to tell the people in the temple, the courtyards, the whole message of this life, the eternal life revealed by Christ and found through faith in him. Well, I liked how they expounded on it, but uh, there's nothing really uh, new or, or nothing that uh, helps me with that term, angel of the Lord. Um, go, verse 20, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Okay, brother, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, to me, it, it's a... It's, uh obvious and it just be and not that i i know for sure but it seems obvious it's a it's a common angel <laughs> you know a, a, an angel that as we would think of uh, uh typically and uh man that that must have really ruffled the feathers of uh the people who put him in the the jail uh and then go right back into the lion's den so yeah but i i, I take it as a common angel back to you Luke. Yeah, well, the, also, uh, they're, they're preaching, they're performing these signs and wonders, everybody's getting healed without exception, and then they're put in jail, but then the angel Lord gets them out of jail and tells them, go preach at the temple. So <laughs> they're told, hey, 
we're letting you out of jail, but keep on doing what you're you're doing. And uh, how many times is it now? I, I think there's at least three, maybe this is the fourth time, where the authorities, the religious authorities, um, tried to make them stop uh, preaching in this name, they said, preaching in the name of Jesus. Um, verse 21, and when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Yeah. What does that sound like, brother? I'll let you go first on this one. Uh, man, yeah, I don't know. That's got to put the fear of God into uh, to the Senate, right? You know, uh, over and over. And man, I would uh, I would repent pretty quick and say maybe there is something to this uh, stuff they're preaching, but uh, evidently not the uh, stiff-necked people of of uh, Israel. Uh, I can't imagine how I would react if I were in charge and I had these guys locked up to shut them up before the people started revolting against me. Come to find out that miraculously they're out of their jail cells. And then someone comes in, oh, by the way, they're just outside in the courtyard and they're doing it again. I, I, you've either got to get crazy angry or crazy scared, probably a combination of the two. Well, I'm a little bit confused by this portion of uh, scriptures. Uh, it says the angel of the Lord opened the doors and let them out. And then later on, it says that the guards said they, they went for him and they weren't there. And then when they gave their report, it says that uh, we were standing guard, the doors were closed. And, and so they, it's, I thought if, 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 the prior verse hadn't said that the angel opened the doors, I would have thought that the Lord just kind of raptured them from one place to another, you know, just transport them. Um, but let me read that fine, that second portion again. It says, uh, this is what the guard said, the prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Why on, on, it says that the angel opened the doors, but then the guards are all saying that well, we, we, we were, the, we found it, the doors all shut with safety and the keepers standing without. So the keepers were standing outside the doors. And, and so that they didn't, uh, somehow they didn't see that the doors had been opened, the people released. I, I'm guessing. I, any thoughts on that? Well, it's it, yeah. Obviously, it's not a, a Star Trek moment of transport <laughs> because it says the angels open the door. All I can say is, is that you know, many times when Christ would uh, uh, they'd pick up stones to to kill him, uh, he would just walk out of their presence, and they wouldn't even see him go. I guess they just had. Uh, heavenly blinders on the uh, on the guards. It's so, like the thing I can think, they physically opened the doors and I guess they must have reclosed them. That's just one of those things left to supposition, I suppose. All right, I'll read, oh, let me read that portion in the Amplified, see how it states it. I bet they speculate on it. <clears throat> um, verse 22, it says, but when the officers arrived, they did not find them in the prison, and they came back and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened the doors, we found no one inside. Yeah, okay. All right, back to the KJV and, and verse 24. Now, when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Uh, then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye 
put in prison or standing in the temple and teaching the people. Uh, then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. Uh, and, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Hmm. Well, it, it's interesting. I think that the Amplified said something about uh, uh, the fact that they didn't mention Jesus' name. They said, uh, uh, he says, um, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? Now, let me read verse 28 in the Amplified. Um, And yet, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. I think there's a footnote on that. Let me see. Uh, Acts 5.20 says, The reason the council members refused to refer to Jesus by name is unclear, but may indicate contempt, guilt, or perhaps fear. All right. What are your thoughts on all that? Well, I think the I think the last sentence that you read uh, brings everything else into focus. Uh, they were worried uh, about the people turning against them. Uh, you know, you're going to bring this guy, uh, to his blood, onto uh, upon us, and so uh, it makes perfect sense. I mean, they crucified the Messiah. I mean, that's a big deal. And I don't even think they could admit it to themselves. You know, obviously, the, the first thing that would come to my mind, uh, it would be, hey, how'd you guys get out of jail? I mean, that's the first thing I would have said. Uh, and they, but yet, they, they, they're keenly aware of the precarious place that they're in. Uh, the guards went out, and they were told, hey, hey, be nice to these guys. Don't, don't let the people see that we're roughing them up. And please invite them into the chambers, you know, privately. Uh, they, they've got one thing on their mind, and that's self-preservation. And I'm not even talking about power. I'm talking about their lives. Uh, should the people in great enough numbers uh, uh, fall in line with the, the Messiah, then uh, they're going to get stoned. They're going to lose their not only their power, but their lives. And so they're panicking. And uh, the only way to secure... Uh, themselves is to uh, either shut these guys up, stop, nip it in the bud, or uh, bow the knee and and walk over to the other side. And uh, who knows where that'll bring them? Because you know there's still the 90% of, Jew of the Jews that don't believe in the Messiah, so they could get uh, get killed that way too. So <laughs> they're in a really uh, bad place between a rock and a hard place, and the rock being Christ. Mm. Well, I remember uh, in each of Peter's sermons, uh, he is pointing the finger at the, the audience, saying, you're the people that rejected him. Pilate wanted to release him, and you said, no, give us somebody else, but not him. And, and uh, these people, I think the scripture says they were pricked to the heart or something, and they, 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 they felt guilty. And uh, they did repent in that they changed their mind and they, they realized that they were wrong about Jesus and now they, they believed in him. Um, so even though the, the audience that Peter preached to, there were guilty parties within the, 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 the audience, uh, but rather than them react in the way that these Sadducees and Pharisees and the Sanhedrin were reacting, or thinking that, uh, well, we're going to be blamed for it. Well, yeah, Peter did blame them. In his sermons, he's blaming them, saying it's your fault, you rejected him, and now, they, now he, he was killed. But he's raised back to life, and we're eyewitnesses of it. And the, the, the audience in his preaching, they, even though they were uh, accused of being the 
responsible for his death, they repented. And whereas these religious leaders, uh, rather than reacting that way, they're afraid, as you said, I, I, I was thinking that they may be uh, uh, afraid to lose their position of power in the government, in, their, in the uh, religious government that they had. But um, if they're afraid that they're going to be uh, killed by the mob, uh, but instead, all they really needed to do was be believe in Jesus, and you know all would have been forgiven that they you know that they were responsible. Um, before I go on, anything else? Well, yeah, that that you know that works out fine if all of the the leaders bowed the knee, but if you're the first one to raise your hand and say, "Okay, I repent. I was wrong." Uh, then uh, you've got a, you've got these other guys who are still in power to deal with, and uh, so who wants to be the first one to raise their hand? Uh, not me, you know. And so uh, also there's also human nature to consider. You know what happened when uh, Adam got nailed for uh, disobeying God? It was, it was her. She she's the one who's responsible. She tempted me or whatever. You know they're the ones who who uh, arranged for the Messiah to be crucified. And everybody knows it, so everyone's going to point their finger at the responsible parties uh, rather than take full responsibility. So uh, I understand their situation. Uh, <laughs> you know, back to you, Luke. Okay, let me read further. Uh, Uh, verse 26, oh no, verse 28, uh, they said, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so it, it so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Uh, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. <laughs> so they were cut to the heart, but instead of believing the way the previous crowds did, and they were cut to the heart, they were, they were, uh, uh, their, but their reaction was not to slay them, but to become a believer. All right, brother, what, what, do, you, what do you say about that? Well, that's, that's kind of, kind of amazing, you know, cut to the heart, you would think would, uh, be a, a, a place of repentance, but in their case, I guess uh, when you cut to the middle of their heart, it's still black, right? Black to the core of the heart. Uh, it made them angry. And uh, uh, well, Christ uh, was there before, right? You know, they found no fault with him, but yet insisted on his crucified, being crucified. Uh, here we go again, kind of the same thing. All right, uh, verse 34, then stood there up, uh, then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Theudas, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, and as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the, of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished. 
and, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel of this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. That's one of the, one of the great uh, speeches of, 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 of reason. Um, brother, what's, what are your thoughts? your thoughts? Well, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, of this doctor, I, 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 for some reason, didn't remember any of this before. But, uh, you know, he's saying that other people have rised up, risen up, saying they were the Messiah, and even had large crowds follow them. And because they were not of God, they perished, and the people who followed them perished. If this is that case, then we have nothing to worry about. God will take care of it. Uh, but uh, if these people are of God, and if the Messiah was the Messiah, you're about to engage in war against God, and you'll perish. Hey, man, you know, here's a guy that, uh, while still not a believer, uh, is is pretty darn smart, don't you think? Uh, he, I think he's got a, a good heart, and he's just, you know, following Scripture here, and uh, he's destined to become a believer, I'm pretty sure, based upon what he's just said. And uh, I, I wonder... How the Pharisees are going to respond to such common sense. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. Well, uh, Gamaliel, uh, when it says he's a, a, a doctor, uh, how does it say? Does it say doctor of the law? I think it does. That he was uh, a doctor of the law. Well, that's the scriptures. The scriptures are broken into the law and the prophets. The law is the first five books. Um, he was considered to be, his reputation was such that he was the authority on the scriptures. Um, the greatest reputation. And so, you know, they would, they would respect what he had to say. But uh, it's, it's also important to note that as we continue on in the study, you'll, you'll find out that uh, the Apostle Paul, who was prior to that, known as Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee, one of the most religious of all the Pharisees, he said that he, like, sat on the, the knee, at the knee of, of Gamaliel. His, his life was studying. Gamaliel was his mentor. Paul, apparently, was Gamaliel's prize student. So, there is a relationship there that uh, is, is important. Um, but he was, as you know, Gamaliel was a doctor of the law, and Paul was extremely zealous for the law. And this is what he really resented about Christianity in, 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 in the, its beginnings, uh, is that uh, it was uh, that uh, rather than putting their faith in the law of Moses, uh, as they had, they, they were saying that put your faith in Jesus, even though it was kind of a combination up to this point until Paul later becomes the champion of this uh, faith alone doctrine that we all believe in, that the, the law is, is not part of a, a formula for salvation. So uh, Paul goes from one extreme to the other the most zealous for the law to one who is later accused of antinomianism, which means someone against the law. <laughs> so that's about as far of an extreme as you can make uh, the transition. Brother? Yeah, you know, that's right, Luke. And, but you know what, what, what I'm thinking is in both states, whether uh, antinomian or or uh, uh, the other direction, I don't know that word, uh, but uh, it's the state of the heart. You know, they, they were seeking truth and were willing to uh, go to any ends to stand up for God and what they knew to be godly. And I think that's why, while Paul was uh, a bit of a tool 
and and uh, and looked at as an antichrist type character, uh, he sought to serve God with everything he had, and all he needed was to hear the truth, and he responds, and so uh, you know, the great keepers of the law uh, are destined uh, to become the the great uh, uh, followers of Christ once the truth is given. I think these Pharisees and Sadducees and lawgivers mentioned uh, didn't have regard for the law. They they had regard for pride and uh, and themselves, and and Christ saw through that when he spoke with them. So uh, uh, no surprise to me. Well, you know, I've I've never really thought about this much, and and uh, because I hadn't thought about it, I never tried to seek an answer but i think i might do a, a, a study and search out to see if there's any indication that gamaliel ever got saved and it seems to me that paul and gamaliel's relationship was so special that after paul's conversion you know he continued going back to uh, preach to the, the jewish people uh, eventually he ended up giving up on it and, and focusing on on Gentiles primarily, but his 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 ministry. Every time he came into a town, his first uh, first thing he did was go into the uh, uh, the synagogue and preach to the Jews first. Um, and so he still and he even said at one time, if if I could make a decision that all of my Jewish brethren would become believers and I would give up my salvation, I would give it up. I mean. To me, that's an amazing thing to even say. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. But uh, um, uh, I'm just wondering if Paul, since he uh, had this close, such a close relation with Gamaliel, if he hadn't paid a uh, a house call some time. Well, Paul or no Paul, based on what this guy just said, uh, I'm willing to bet ten bucks that you'll find he became a Christian. Uh, I don't have any doubt of that. Just just based on, you know, the, what you say about Paul is is highly intriguing. But based just on this short part of scripture you just read, based on what he said, uh, he's destined to become a believer. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, well, it certainly was uh, the voice of, of reason, and it was it's, it's a it's a logical arg argument that uh, you know, look we've had these uh, false Christs. Uh, appear in the past uh, and um, the reason we know they're false is because it, it ended up you know dissipating and, and didn't come to anything uh, and and and, and, and if, if this is the same kind of a thing then it'll dissipate too so don't worry about it but if it doesn't if it grows and you know then then you can be convinced then that it is of God and if that's the case you better you better pay close attention to this so it was very reasonable what he says to them let's see how they uh they respond verse 39 but if it be of god ye cannot overthrow it lest happily ye be found even to fight against god and to him they agreed and when they had called the apostles and beaten them <laughs> well, this is crazy they agreed to just let them go but not without giving them a beating first um, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of jesus so they're still sticking to their guns they still decide they've got to beat them and then they got to tell them don't preach that name jesus anymore just like they had said four or five times before and their their command is ignored every time they even they, it's not like they say okay well we won't do it anymore and then they secretly go out and do it they defy them right to their face say we're we're not going to listen to you why should we listen to men we're going to listen to what god wants us to do and and so uh, they they tell them right to their face i'm not going to we're not going to obey your command we are going to preach the name of jesus and then they go out and do it again and again and again but they let them go um in verse 41 and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, brother. 
Well, I was just saying, I'm dying to, to uh, hear how this turns out after this guy's eloquent uh, little speech there. Well, <laughs> I guess he talked him out of killing him, uh, but they gave him a good beating. I, well, you know, well, you got to wonder, you know, what the heck's going through their heads, but here it is. And what, you know, Christ said, uh, they will do to you what they did to me. So they fully expected such treatment and, and said, well, here's another word of Christ come true. And what's most amazing is daily. And I guess that means every single day they went back to the temple and preached again and, and wherever else. So that's how that little story turned out. Uh, well, the, the part, one, the part here that, um, there's so much in this last few verses here to get excited about, but uh, it said, uh, uh, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer, to suffer shame for his name, for Jesus. They were rejoicing that they were had suffered because of Jesus, because because of the, their their faithfulness in proclaiming Jesus, so they were they were happy that they were able to, to suffer for for that that cause, and, and it says and daily in the temple in every house, so they're they're not only going to the temple back again and again, but to house to house doing you know knocking on doors and doing that kind of evangelism, they cease not to preach, teach and preach Jesus. Yeah. Um, well, any, any more thoughts on those last verses there? Just that, uh, you know, I, I wish I had their uh, spirit. You know, that I guess that's just amazing to me. You know, I've, I've uh, had people insult uh, people that I love. And my first reaction is, is, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to re return their, their kindness and, and uh, uh, in a far more, unbeneficial way by you know these guys are just so full of the spirit I, i'm thinking of uh, the missionary and I, the name escapes me but their husbands were killed by uh, cannibals and uh they went back years later not only forgave them but uh, started to preach again to them you probably remember who it is but uh yeah that kind of spirit uh is is uh, most noble and admirable and, and absent from me i guess but uh... okay, um, you, the the last couple of seconds there, you 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 froze a little bit. So I, I'm I'm hoping you're still everything's functioning right tech technologically here. I'm I'm, I'm still here, Luke. I, I I probably clicked too soon. Thank you. Okay. Um, Well, my thought on, on this, this boldness and this joy that they have of being preaching, even, even though they're suffering for it, um, and they haven't been killed yet, but they've been put in jail, they've been received several beatings now, and the threats of, of, of uh, death. Um, but why are they doing it? Why do they have that kind of boldness? Uh, well, first of all, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. They're, they're baptized as the Spirit and indwelled and sealed with the Spirit. But then they're also filled with the Spirit of God, giving them power and boldness to do this preaching. But more than anything, I would say it's the experience with the risen Christ. This is the thing that changed these apostles from cowards hiding out for their lives in, in fear that they killed Jesus and they're, they'll be coming for them next. And then in three days, they're suddenly they're transformed into the boldest preachers. Uh, they would all all of them would preach uh, for for years. Uh, eventually, at the cost of their lives, even John suffered in imprisonment and exile. So they all suffered martyrdoms in some kind. Um, and it was that it was that bodily resurrection of Jesus that that gave them that kind of confidence. And so and maybe, Brother Joe, if you and I had been back there and touched Jesus and ate with him after, and as, as the risen Christ and uh, been an eyewitness to that, 
maybe our confidence, our faith would have been so great and, and our, uh, that um, perhaps hopefully we would, we would be just as bold and, and uh, con uh, committed to this uh, preaching. Um, it's that resurrection, of course, is, we preach every day here in the in our gospel message is that resurrection that is it is is the biggest event that uh, made the difference for the that without the resurrection Paul said that we're all just fools we're miserable fools to to put a faith in Jesus if there was no resurrection um, let me get your summary uh, we're going to stop a little bit early because uh, um, it's the end of the chapter. And uh, this will give us time for some closing thoughts and the uh, gospel message. And the, rather than starting a new chapter, uh, brother, uh, give me uh, your summary of the study today. Well, uh, it's been a good study. Uh, I would, I would uh, just add that, you know, more than once I've said that the greatest, we're talking about the miracles of the apostles. And of course, uh, we're in agreement. The greatest miracle is, is changed lives and uh and the recognition or the belief that christ is who he said he is and and did what he said he would do and uh i would say that the miracles that we're seeing here you're saying well they saw the risen christ you know what there are still people today and lots of them who live in persecution who show the exact same bravery and the exact same love that the apostles did back then uh, that gift is still alive and well uh, I'm thinking of the of a couple months ago when the Isis people rounded up the Christians in a town in Iraq and uh, they were gonna chop their heads off there was uh, I think uh, 21 men and uh, the wives of these men petitioned Isis and uh, said please allow them to have their final words. And they gave them a chance to express their final words. Each one of those men, just prior to having their heads lopped off, and I don't mean in a quick way, they do it in the most gruesome, dull knife kind of fashion, uh, forgave the people who were about to kill them and preached the gospel of a risen Christ. Uh, that's every bit the miracle and every bit the testimony that the apostles had back then is still alive today. And uh, we do well to, to uh, uh, remember that, that that greatest miracle uh, is still here with us if we'll look. And, uh, and God said that uh, in Revelations that the world's not worthy of such men. And uh, uh, that what higher praise uh, can God bestow upon his people? And I dare say that if we were under that type of persecution, maybe we would have that kind of spiritual gift also. Maybe. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, I, it's, uh, of course, the apostles at this point, uh, they've only received some beatings. Eventually, it gets worse. They're all uh, executed for their faith. And then uh, after the apostles and the first century church, um, passes, the, the, you enter the second, third, fourth centuries, it, do, it never stops. The, the church remains persecuted throughout all of church history. I've mentioned before that there's a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is a, a historical record that goes into great detail, um, graphic detail about the tortures and deaths of these martyrs throughout history. It's not a fun book to read, but it's out of respect to the, the, the price that they paid for their faith. Uh, I do recommend that everybody read Fox, a Book of Martyrs. There's another version that's more contemporary and modern called Jesus Freaks. And it's part one and part two, and it's very large and very thick. But it, it, that's talking about contemporary people, people today, the type of people you've just referred to, uh, Brother Joe, even today. Christians are being martyred all over the world. And so there are still the same kind of boldness and uh, faithful preaching uh, of the gospel, no, even though they know that it's going to be at the expense of their lives, but knowing they also know that they have a promise, eternal life. 
from Jesus. So that gets us to the, the gospel message. And um, it, it, I think it's important to understand that if, if a person believes that there is some sort of life after death, and particularly if someone says, well, there, I do believe there is a heaven and there's a hell, and I don't want to go to hell, but I want to go to heaven. So what do you have to do in order to go to hell instead of hell? Well, uh, if, if you've at least reached that point where you want to know, what do you have to do? Um, there are basically two ways in the world that, that people are putting their faith in. One is they put their faith in themselves and their, their ability to um, be religious, uh, to, uh, to do religious works, their own religious efforts. They're putting their faith in that. And they think that if I'm just religious enough, if I'm a good enough person, God will approve of me and allow me into heaven. And then the other way is, is uh, rather than faith in yourself, but rather you put your faith in Jesus as your savior. You put your faith in who he is and what he's done for you and his promise that he'll give you eternal life as a free gift. These are the two options that people really have. All the religions of the world fall into that first option, religious works. And it says in Romans 10, 3, it actually tells us about these two ways. It says, uh, this is referencing the people who uh, are not putting their faith in Jesus here. It says, for they don't understand that Christ has died to make them right with God. Instead, they're trying to make themselves good enough to gain God's favor by keeping the laws and customs, but that is not God's way of salvation. So that's why I, I hope everybody will understand. I mean, you might listen to preachers on the radio or on television, or maybe you attend local churches, but the churches across America and all over, at least Europe, I, I, probably all over the world, most of them are teaching plan A, religious works, join the religion, uh, follow the religious rules. Uh, and uh, if you do it well enough, keep your fingers crossed and hopefully God will say, well done, you get, you get to come in. But that's not uh, the type of Christianity we find in the Bible, what I would call biblical Christianity. Christianity because... Uh, your faith is not in yourself, but your faith is in Christ as the means of salvation. Not your, not your self-righteousness, but Christ himself. So that's what I, I hope you will understand the difference and realize that getting to heaven through your own religious uh, efforts is futility. The Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, the standard that you have to meet is perfection. And uh, as we try to be good, we never even come close to the, the standard that you've got to meet. The standard was set by Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life as an example. So if you can equal what I've done, then you don't need me. You can get down on your own. But if you can admit that you can't be perfect, it's impossible. Then you'll understand your need for Jesus. And... Uh, so put your faith in Jesus instead of yourself. Depend on him completely. Rely on him. Basically, I'm asking you to believe that you, you are going to go to heaven solely because of Jesus Christ. Because he promises eternal life in heaven to everyone who puts their faith in him. And the Bible says God cannot break a promise. God cannot lie. So you can have confidence that his promise it will be kept. He is faithful. Um, so, uh, in every one of my videos, I post in the description box the core doctrines of Christianity that we hope you will understand and believe and, and Bible verses that support this gospel message. And it, the, the facts are that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He's not merely a prophet. He's not some creature that God made like an angel. He is God himself, but he came down from heaven and became a man. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. Uh, why did he become a man? He said he came to give his life as a ransom. To, in order to die, he had to become a man, Jesus of Nazareth. So 
he, he did die on that cross and that death on the cross, the Bible says it served as a full payment for the sins of mankind. It says he's the propitiation for our sins. That means those of us who believe in him. And it says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So if you, no one's ever told you this before, you need to understand Jesus paid for all your sins. You, see, you should say, thank you, Jesus. Now, sin is not an obstacle for you getting into heaven. It's no longer a sin barrier separating you from God. You can have access to God. You can go to heaven, but Jesus said only through him. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So he paid for your sins, and he's the way to get into heaven. Just put your faith in him. Now, why should you believe in him? He says, I'll, I'll prove that uh, your faith in me is justified because they're going to kill me and bury me. But on the third day, I'll raise myself back to life bodily. And that will be the sign that proves my claims are true. And it's that bodily resurrection that gave the apostles the confidence to preach boldly, even at the cost of their lives. It's the bodily resurrection of Jesus that gives us all confidence today that our, our faith is not in vain. So I hope now you will choose Jesus. Stop trying to get to heaven some other way. Put your faith in him. At the instant you do, you're guaranteed eternal life. You receive the gift of eternal life. You're promised you're going to go to heaven. So, And the Bible says it's irrevocable and irreversible. Once you put your faith in Jesus, no matter what happens after that, you can be certain you're going to go to heaven. Not because you're such a good person, but because of the good things that Jesus did for you. Uh, brother, any last words before we close? Well, just that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I like to make time for these Bible studies, uh, for the opportunity to study with you, Luke. Uh, but uh, what's really important is the last few minutes, of course. And the, the fact that maybe someone uh, who is unsure or unbelieving uh, will stumble upon this and and uh, become a believer. And uh, so that's that's what's really important. Uh, and so I'm so glad we got a chance to do that yet again today. Back to you. Okay. Thank you, brother. Um, uh, we try to do these broadcasts uh, daily. We'll do them as often as possible, uh, as long as our schedules permit. So look for us daily at about around 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. We'll continue working our way through the Book of Acts. It'll probably take quite a while to get through it all. And then after that, I'm not sure where, what study we'll take on next. But uh, thank you for participating, Brother Joe. And uh, to anybody viewing the video, thank you for watching and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.